First of all, I'd like to say welcome uh, to you all. A welcome to what we hope will be an annual affair, uh, the Law Society of British Columbia's Rule of Law Lecture. My name's Craig Ferris. I'm a bencher and I'm the chair of the Rule of Law and Lawyer Independence Committee of the Law Society. Part of the Law Society's mandate, if you look at the Legal Profession Act, is to uphold and protect the public interest in the administration of justice by preserving and protecting the rights and freedoms of all persons. It's a pretty big mandate. Uh, fundamental to this mandate is the protection of the rule of law. To further this mandate, the Rule of Law Committee has been actively engaged in a number of rule of law initiatives over the past few years. We've made submissions to the federal government on Bill C-51 and electronic surveillance generally. We made submissions on the appointment of Supreme Court of Canada justices. We've been issuing regular written commentaries on rule of law issues. And if you go to uh, our committee page on the Law Society of BC websites, uh, you'll find our commentaries. We have sponsored a high school essay contest on the rule of law. And the, the winners for the current year will be announced next week at our benchers meeting. And for those of you who use Twitter, you can follow us at Rule of Law BC. And we tweet from time to time on issues. And on top of all of that, we are now starting uh, what we hope will be an annual affair of the Rule of Law Lecture. So tonight, your moderator will be John Festinger, QC. And just a few words about John. John is a very active member of our committee. Uh, he's a McGill uh, University graduate in 1982, and he practices through his firm, Festinger Law and Strategy. He is affiliated with a number of academic institutions, the Allard School of Law, uh, the Center for Digital Media at SFU, uh, the TRU Law, and the Center for Commercial Studies at the Queen Mary University of London. He's been the General Counsel of WIC, a Senior Vice President at CTV, and he was Vice President and General Counsel at, for the Vancouver Canucks for a number of years. So I'm going to pass the podium to John, and John's first task is to explain to you uh, how the British Airways IT disaster has impacted the lecture you will see tonight. Thank you. Well, I, I'm going to hold off a little bit on that explanation um, and the irony in it. Um, let me start talking uh, a little bit about um, what tonight is about. Um, and thank you, Craig. It's, it's really an honor to be asked to do this. Um, so the, the name of the talk, or the talks, are Brexit, Presidential Executive Orders, and the Rule of Law, a discussion on the limits of executive power. So on Friday, November 4th, 2016, a day after the Lord Chief Justice and two other senior justices of the English High Court rendered a judgment which found that the British government could not begin the process of formally withdrawing from the European Union without Parliament's approval. The Daily Mail, just below headshots of the three judges, <laughs> labeled them enemies of the people in font that I would point out is two to three times the size of the masthead. Very unusual. And then on another Friday, Friday, February 3rd, 2017, on a flight to Palm Beach, after US District Judge John Robart of Seattle blocked a travel ban against seven mainly Muslim nations, President Donald Trump tweeted, just cannot believe a judge would put our country in such peril. If something happens, blame him and the court system. People pouring in, and you know the next word, bad. <laughs> Madam Justice Rosalie Abella, 10 days ago, at a commencement speech that she delivered at Brandeis University, said she was, quote, deeply worried about the state of justice in the world. Justice Abella suggested that the lessons of the past are being lost in a world where, quote, narcissistic populism 
and disregard for human rights, courts, free press, and democratic norms are increasingly common. These are certainly strange and different times. The rule of law underlies everything we do and say and teach and act upon in our profession. As Mark Cohen wrote in Forbes magazine just yesterday about the rule of law, lawyers are its first responders and last defenders. To help us try to understand the threats to the rule of law and its opportunities, we have two outstanding legal colleagues from the UK and the US. Richard Gordon QC is not, unfortunately, with us today. The irony is that uh, he, is, he was the lead lawyer in the high profile Brexit case, acting um, against the government. And so somebody who you could characterize as being anti-Brexit, the irony is, of course, he couldn't get out of the country because of British Airways and their IT disaster. Um, he has, uh, and he will be speaking to us uh, through the magic of technology. He has his MA from Oxford uh, and an LLM from University of London. He was called in 1972, and he has appeared in a number of high-profile landmark cases. He is also a visiting professor of law in the Faculty of Laws, University College London since 1994, and honorary professor in the Faculty of Law, University of Hong Kong since 2011. And uh, some of you now know because of Craig that I used to be in the television business with WIC, yet I've never said the following words, roll tape. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, let me say how sorry I am not to be with you tonight. I did everything I possibly could to get away from Heathrow uh, on Saturday. Uh, my luggage is still missing, and I'm afraid I wasn't able to uh, rebook in time. I always thought it was a good idea to be uh, grounded as a human being, but I must say uh, the experience at Heathrow uh, last Saturday uh, made me question that particular attribute. Uh, now, what I've done, uh, given that I can't be with you, is to prepare a text which you can obtain from Michael Lewis, uh, I'm sorry, from Michael Lucas, uh, if you um, uh, would like to read it. I'm more than happy also, having missed the Q&As, to answer any questions that you might wish to send me uh, by uh, email. Uh, having prepared a text, it will be uh, slightly more formal than would have been the case if I had an audience in front of me rather than a camera, uh, but I will try to break off from time to time uh, to make more uh, impromptu um, points. So what are we all here, me not quite there, uh, to talk about? Is it, is it uh, Brexit, specifically perhaps the recent high-profile Miller case in the United Kingdom Supreme Court? Is it presidential executive orders? including possibly other concerns about the uh, recent use of presidential power in the United States? Or is it about making the executive more uh, accountable? I wonder if it isn't perhaps about something even wider. Like democracy, the rule of law is the comforting sounding concept. We feel safer in a country like Canada, like the United States, like the United Kingdom, where these axioms are taken for uh, granted. As uh, Euclid observed, you cannot question an axiom, or as the British comedian, comedian Eric Morecambe used to quip, you can't say more than that. But what do we mean when we talk about the rule of law? We may all talk about the same thing, but have we yet agreed what it is we're talking about? Can the rule of law, like the famous uh, scientific observer effect doctrine, change in the eye of the beholder? I think it can. And in the short time I have, I want to say a few words about uh, three things. First of all, the different aspects uh, of the rule of law as a purely legal concept. In other words, I want to talk quite generally about the rule of law. Secondly, uh, leading on to Miller, how some of the general aspects of the rule of law played into the Miller case in the Supreme Court. 
And finally, I want to come to, in a way, drawing these threads together and talking about the reality of executive power in the United Kingdom, uh, given that unlike uh, most Western liberal democracies, uh, including Canada, including the United States, we have no written constitution, but we do have something called the rule of law. So let me start then with the rule of law. It is perhaps fair to observe that the rule of law has never been defined. Previous attempts to hug the concept uh, have been vague in the extreme. Consider, for example, Professor John Finnis. Uh, his definition of the rule of law was the name commonly given to the state of affairs in which a legal system is legally in good shape. Well, that's pretty revealing, is it not? All this from Professor Jeremy Waldron on the use of the phrase by different sides in the Bush and Gore loose, uh, lawsuit as really meaning, hooray for our side. Uh, well, we didn't get very far with definitions until Lord Bingham, the closest anyone has got to the nirvana of precise definition in terms of the rule of law is the late Lord Bingham in his excellent groundbreaking work, The Rule of Law. In this magisterial survey, he came up with eight components of the rule of law. Let me give them to you briefly. One, the requirement that the law must be accessible, intelligible, clear, and predictable. Two, legal liability and rights ought not to be governed by discretion, but rather by application of the law, kind of legal certainty, if you like. Three, law should be applied equally to all, save where objective differences justify differentiation. In other words, laws should not discriminate. Four, the law must afford adequate protection of fundamental human rights. Five, legal disputes must be capable of being resolved without prohibitive cost or ordinate delay, if you like, access to justice. Six, powers must be exercised reasonably, in good faith, and within the limits of the power. In other words, uh, rational exercise of power subject to judicial review. And finally, adjudicative procedures provided by the state should be fair, sorry, lastly, eight, the state must comply with its obligations under international law. Now, my purpose in outlining Lord Bingham's template in this way is not to question his wisdom or his choices, but rather to make three points. First, I suggest that his selection contains a necessary assumption or premise as to what the rule of law may legitimately comprise within its content. Secondly, I suggest that even if Lord Bingham's content were to be agreed by everybody, its application would still raise important issues. Thirdly, and leading on from this, a subject I will leave to part three of this talk, I suggest that the rule of law is ultimately reducible to a power concept and that its real significance and function is to act as a curb on uncontrolled executive power. Now, it seems to me that Lord Bingham's chosen categories assume not merely a thin idea of the rule of law, but also a thick idea of what it contains. Some of you in the audience will know what I mean by thin and thick, but let me explain. There are two broad ideas uh, of the proper scope of the rule of law. The first notion is a formalist or thin theory. Under this concept, the rule of law requires that laws must merely comply with certain formal rules in order to be valid. This is irrespective of their content. So a murderous and repressive regime, take Hitler's uh, Germany, uh, could meet the rule of law under this thin or formalist version, uh, because uh, nothing was more meticulous than the Nazi uh, laws uh, which led to the uh, persecution of the Jewish people. The second theory of the rule of law is a substantive or a thick theory. Under this version of the rule of law, uh, judges would assess the content as well as the form of law, requiring substantive rights uh, to be uh, recognised. It will be apparent that Lord Bingham's chosen categories contain a mixture of thin and thick rule of law elements. Thus, for example, the requirement that the law must be accessible and intelligible is part of a thin version of the rule of law. It is important, but it tells us nothing about the content uh, of the law. By contrast, Lord Bingham's last category, that a state must comply with its obligations under international law is plainly part of a thick version of the rule of law uh, because it prescribes its content. Under this version, a state could not pass a law 
the content of which violated its international uh, law obligations. The difference between a thin and a thick version of the rule of law is by no means academic, as I've hinted at a few moments ago. In his wonderful book, Defying Hitler, Sebastian Hafner reveals how Hitler's persecution of the Jews in the years leading to 1939 was initially effected by laws meticulously and precisely drafted so as to achieve their intended effects. Even in more modern times, I can disclose that in meetings that I had with a previous Lord Chancellor, we discussed possible domestic legislation that would conflict with provisions of the European Convention on Human Rights, which is a treaty, an international treaty, uh, that the UK has entered into. In the United Kingdom, I should say, that the Lord Chancellor takes an oath promising to comply with the rule of law that's written into his oath. His view was that because, his view I should say was, that because international treaties were not binding in the United Kingdom unless specifically incorporated into domestic law, he could ignore purely international obligations. The Lord Chancellor, when taking his oath, and subsequently that Lord Chancellor, might have benefited from leading, reading Lord Bingham's book, or I suppose he might have disagreed with it and opted for a thin version of the rule of law. The key point I want to make is that there is no universal consensus, even about the general scope of the rule of law as a juridical concept. But even if there were, that would not remove the challenges intrinsic to arriving at a proper definition of the rule of law. This is because there is no obvious consensus or agreement in society as to those elements of even a thick version of the rule of law that should appear in our laws. Nowhere is this clearer than in the protection of fundamental rights, part of a thick version of the rule of law. Let us agree uh, for the moment, although the drafters of the Australian Constitution apparently didn't consider it necessary, that protecting fundamental rights is a necessary element of the rule of law. The question then arises, who decides? The fundamental rights case law of the United Kingdom is replete, I'm sure it is in Canada, with case law in which judges overturn, or at least declare laws to be incompatible with the European Convention. Parliament may have drafted the laws, but the judges interpret the laws. When these kinds of conflict arise, politicians complain that judges are illegitimately entering into the political arena. They, they, that's the politicians, claim a democratic mandate, and they say that judges being unelected, I appreciate in America slightly different, uh, but judges being unelected ought not, uh, in substance, to be able to strike down laws passed by an elected parliament. And of course, when we're talking about society, I should add that society includes the people, as the recent Brexit referendum vote shows, who may make claims to have a say in what laws are passed and how they are uh, passed. It is at this stage that ideas about the rule of law start to shade from definition or clarity, if you like, into politics. The question arises, uh, there may be something called a rule of law or the rule of law, but who decides exactly what it is? Who makes that decision? At this stage, the rule of law may morph into a political concept, and this is something I want to address in the last part of this talk. Let me now turn to Miller and its connection, connection of that case in the Supreme Court recently, uh, and the rule of law. I will not go into why the British government decided to hold a referendum into whether the United Kingdom should remain a member state of the European Union. So more to do with internal dissension within the Conservative Party than to any principled desire to leave this major constitutional issue to the British public. Indeed, I would go further and suggest that continued membership of the EU was so low on the radar of the electorate that it became a constitutional issue only after the referendum result was known. The then Prime Minister, David Cameron, had not supposed for one moment that he would lose the referendum. He'd only offered it in the first place because it seemed an easy way out of his internal political problems and because he never expected to have a majority after the 2015 general election. At best, so he reasoned, there would be a coalition uh, with the Liberal Democrats, as there had been for the previous five years. And he could use resistance to a referendum by his junior coalition partners, the Liberal Democrat Party, to justify breaking his referendum manifesto uh, commitment. That's how I think the politics played out. 
However, when on June the 24th, 2016, the vote for Brexit was known, the outcome was known, it created enormous constitutional turmoil. That turmoil brought with it fundamental constitutional questions that had never been thought about. And with those questions, in fact, I suggest precisely because of those questions, came a constitutional firestorm. Most, if not all, constitutional questions are at root about executive power, and Brexit is no exception. David Cameron had promised that the vote of the British people would be decisive as to whether the United Kingdom stayed in or left the EU. Yet as a matter of well-established constitutional doctrine, it was a promise he was not entitled to give. This is because we live in a representative democracy and not a popular democracy. Uh, put another way, Parliament, and not the executive in the United Kingdom, makes the law, and there's nothing, there was nothing, in the European Union Referendum Act 2015, passed by Parliament, of course, to say, as other referendum legislation had said, that the result of the referendum in any way bound Parliament. Parliament simply remained silent on that question. There was another complication in that half of the United Kingdom, Scotland and Northern Ireland, had actually voted in favour of remaining in the EU. Although only the Westminster Parliament, of all the parliaments in the United Kingdom, has unlimited sovereignty, there was a political cauldron brewing as far as the devolved assemblies were concerned, in that Scotland and Northern Ireland considered, as indeed did Wales, uh, that their governments also possessed sovereignty and could not be forced to leave the EU against their will. So on the date of the Brexit vote, I suggest that there were at least four competing power players in the United Kingdom constitutional arrangements. They were, one, the executive, or if you like, the government, two, the Westminster Parliament, three, the devolved assemblies, uh, particularly of Northern Ireland and um, uh, Scotland, and finally, four, the people. Each of these players uh, was to have arguments advanced on their behalf in Miller, in the Supreme Court. Yet the storm when it erupted came, like many storms, from a most unexpected direction. I doubt if most people in the United Kingdom, including the United Kingdom government, had ever heard of Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty. Yet it was to surface with a vengeance very soon after the Brexit vote and embroil all the different players in different ways. Put shortly, Article 50 was the only prescribed route for exiting the European Union. It permitted a member state wishing to exit to notify the European Union of its intention to do so, quote, in accordance with its own constitutional requirements, unquote. Its wording was deliberately vague. No one had ever used Article 50 before. Lord Kerr, who drafted it, said he didn't know what it meant because it had never been intended to use it. What became clear is that the negotiating process over leaving the EU was heavily weighted in favour of the now 27 remaining states. But that was down the line, because what was also unclear was who triggered Article 50 and whether or not the process could be stopped once begun. That's still, by the way, an issue which nobody knows. And if Labour win the election, who knows whether there'll be an attempt to revoke Article 50. The reason why Miller is the most important constitutional case for several hundred of years, perhaps the most important constitutional case ever, is because the United Kingdom, compelled by the wording of Article 50 to navel-gaze and examine its own constitutional requirements, suddenly discovered that it had absolutely no idea what they were. Treaty-making and withdrawal from treaties once made were traditionally within the remit of the government in exercise of what we call the royal prerogative, that is, powers originally vested in the crown and lacking any statutory underpinning. On the other hand, so to the prerogative is a, a supra-parliamentary power uh, which is not controllable by Parliament. Uh, on the other hand, the effect of an exercise of prerogative powers to pull us out of the EU would necessarily affect huge swathes of laws passed by Parliament. Many of those laws conferred, for example, fundamental rights. Moreover, the EU treaty itself was brought into domestic law by an Act of Parliament called the European Communities Act 1972. Withdrawal from the EU treaties would strip the legislation of any legitimate content. The devolution legislation giving devolved powers 
to Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales was also predicated on the 1972 Act remaining in force. If you look at the devolution legislation, you can see it hinges on, uh, in part at least, on being a member of the EU and the devolved assemblies have to legislate in accordance with European Union law and indeed uh, fundamental rights law. So the consequences of triggering Article 50 would not only affect a treaty entered into under executive or prerogative power, it would also, to use familiar constitutional language, have the effect of dispensing with laws passed by Parliament, the important principle, the non-dispensing principle. With the benefit of hindsight, it might have been helpful if at least someone in the government had read Article 50 before the Brexit vote and before David Cameron had promised what he could not deliver as a matter of law. What was nonetheless assumed was that the executive, in exercise of its treaty-making prerogative powers, would be empowered to trigger withdrawal from the EU under Article 50. That was just a given. Nobody even talked about it before the uh, referendum. Gina Miller, a well-heeled and public-spirited citizen, did not agree. She brought a case challenging the government's right to use executive power, prerogative power, to commence withdrawal from the EU. Although before the case was heard, the academic consensus was that she would lose. In fact, she won both in the first instance court, known as the Divisional Court, headed by the Lord Chief Justice, and in the Supreme Court, where the case was uniquely heard by all the justices. I gather the positions different in the uh, US and possibly in Canada, but very rare for all the justices, never happened before, to sit on a single uh, case. Now, it's beyond the scope of my talk to go into the detail of all the judgments in the uh, Supreme Court. My purpose is rather to relate the decision to our central subject, to the rule of law, and the use of executive power. On one level, Miller may be seen as the rule of law in action. After all, the courts placed a curb on executive power by insisting that the executive, the government, seek legislative authority from Parliament to trigger Article 50. In a very loose sense, that is consistent with the rule of law as relied on throughout the centuries in cases such as Entick and Carrington, in which Lord Camden made it clear not even the king could cause a search and seizure warrant to be issued in the absence of uh, statutory law. As he observed, quote, if this is law, it would be found in our books, but no such law ever existed in this country. Our law holds the property of man so sacred that no man can set upon his neighbour's close without his leave." Uh, unquote. Yet in my view it would be erroneous to view Miller as falling naturally into this category of case. In Miller, the Supreme Court did not in fact claim to be curbing executive power, but rather to be clarifying, and it has to be said, in my view at least not very clearly, some constitutional fundamentals. The Supreme Court divided eight to three in favour of upholding the lower court's verdict. But it did so on a rather strange basis. I was instructed in Miller, by the way, on the, uh, <coughs> for the government of Wales, and the way I wanted to run the case, and did run the case, was to press arguments based upon what I mentioned a few moments ago, the non-dispensing principle laid down in the 17th century proclamations case. And if you're looking for a case to rival Miller in terms of the most important constitutional case ever, in the United Kingdom, it would be the proclamations case. So in the proclamations case, Sir Edward Cook, spelled C-O-K-E, uh, we always pronounce words in English different from how they sound, not Coke, but Cook. There Sir Edward Cook held that, quote, the king by his proclamation or other ways cannot change any part of the common law or statute law or the customs of the realm, unquote. The principle also appears, the non-dispensing principle, in the Bill of Rights, 1688, let me quote, The Lord's spiritual and temporal and commons declare that the pretended power of dispensing with laws or the execution of laws by regal authorities as it hath been assumed and exercised of late is illegal. And as Eric Morgan would have said, as I said earlier, you can't say more than that. However, unlike the lower court, the majority judgment in the Supreme Court, uh, and indeed the minority judgment, uh, too, did not found its reasoning on this ancient constitutional principle of non-dispensing. Instead, the President, Lord Newberger, who gave the one judgment with which seven other justices agreed, implicitly suggested that the issues in Miller were unique, concerned as they were 
with withdrawal from the EU. The majority reasoning relied on a wholly new point not raised by any of the parties before the court, which is that EU law is a source of United Kingdom law. This conclusion was reached despite the fact that the majority also considered that the rule of recognition, that's the fundamental rule by which all other rules and laws are validated, and which only recognise statute and the common law as the source of UK law, uh, that um, uh, rec uh, recognition uh, remained unchanged, the rule of recognition remained unchanged by EU membership. So there's a, there's a tension, if you like, in the court saying at one and the same time, EU law is a unique source of, e of UK law. On the other hand, the only source of UK law is statute law and um, uh, common law. So I think the majority was compelled by the internal tensions in its own reasoning, which I've just referred to, uh, to say that, quote, in one sense, uh, unquote, UK law in the form of the European Communities Act 1972, quote, is the source of EU law, unquote, because, quote, without that act, EU law would have no domestic status, unquote. Yet so the reasoning proceeded that this was inadequately realistic, and the court preferred the view that it is the institutions of the EU which are the relevant source of uh, UK law. The minority reasoning, headed by Lord Reid, so that's the three, the gang of three, reached a correct conclusion as far as source of law was concerned, in my view at least, ruling that only the 1972 Act could be the relevant source of domestic law. Uh, and then what he did was to interpret the 1972 Act as encompassing withdrawal from the EU, and he found that whilst withdrawal from the EU altered its application, it was not inconsistent with it. So you probably can see that I agree with the outcome of Miller because of the non-dispensing principle, um, but I uh, think that the logic of the minority on the, lo on the underpinning of what the majority thought, the, un the, the logic of the minority is actually uh, more correct. Now, in my view, it would have been sensible and possible for the Supreme Court to have dismissed the government's appeal by reference to fundamental constitutional principle, the non-dispensing principle, which would then have made Miller the modern equivalent of the proclamations case and would have guaranteed its legacy to history. That it chose not to do so is interesting in itself and relevant in part to, now, to what I now want to say in conclusion about the rule of law as a power concept. So I'm moving to the last part of the talk, the reality of executive power in the United Kingdom. We have seen how the rule of law as a concept lacks clear legal definition. I think the only United Kingdom Act of Parliament to refer to it by name is the Constitutional Reform Act 2005, which by Section 1 provides that nothing in the Act shall adversely affect the existing constitutional principle of the rule of law or the Lord Chancellor's existing constitutional role in relation to that uh, principle. However, nothing in that or any other Act seeks to define what is meant by the rule of law. I have identified two possible meanings. One, though its content may not be agreed, is the scope of certain procedural and or substantive requirements of legislation. The second, and I've only really hinted at it up to now, is that the rule of law operates as a political or power concept. I think that many of our legal and constitutional axioms start to dissolve when you probe their logic and their history. The Crown held power for many years in England by virtue of a doctrine called the Divine Right of Kings. This was used to justify absolute royal power. But when Parliament gained control over the Crown, it became necessary to fashion a new theory, and so was born the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty, which, in its modern incarnation, by the Victorian jurist A.V. Dicey, came to mean that Parliament can make and unmake any laws whatsoever. So Parliament's the top, if you like. It's the, it's the boss, the head honcho. And that's quite recent. That's A.V. Dicey. These doctrines are what I term, that's to say, uh, sovereignty, uh, divine right of kings, and rule of law. These doctrines are what I term power-sustaining devices and are deployed to justify claims to ultimate constitutional authority. I suggest, though I've not heard it stated, that the power-sustaining device for the judges in modern times is the doctrine of the rule of law. Like the divine right of kings, like parliamentary authority, it has no clear provenance or consensual definition, but repeated claims to it as an authoritative concept give it a legitimacy which stakes the judge's claim 
to constitutional supremacy. After all, if a law fails the test of conformity with the rule of law, it will be the judges that make that decision and through it gain constitutional recognition as a higher source of authority than the executive. At the same time, the ultimate current constitutional authority in the United Kingdom is Parliament. The judges interpret the law, but Parliament is sovereign. Or is it? Relatively recently, the idea has been advanced that parliamentary sovereignty is but a construct of the common law, and the assertion implicitly made by the judges that if Parliament were to legislate contrary to the rule of law, the judges could and would intervene to preserve the rule of law. Consider, for example, Lord Steyn in the Parliament Act case in 2005, <clears throat> and I'll read what he said. The classic account given by Dicey of the doctrine of the supremacy of Parliament, pure and absolute as it was, can now be seen to be out of place in the modern United Kingdom. Nevertheless, the supremacy is still the general principle of our Constitution. It is a construct of the common law. The judges created this principle. If that is so, it is not unthinkable that circumstances could arise where the courts may have to qualify a principle established under a different hypothesis of constitutionalism. In exceptional circumstances involving an attempt, for example, to abolish judicial review or the ordinary role of the courts, the appellate committee of the House of Lords or a new Supreme Court may have to consider whether this is a constitutional fundamental, which even a sovereign parliament acting at the behest of a complacent House of Commons cannot abolish. It's pretty strong stuff. And these words coming from an eminent, albeit well-known liberal law lord, uh, surprising enough as they are, uh, were echoed by a more conservative law lord in the same case, that two law lords, uh, Lord Hope and, and Lady Hale. Lord Hope observed that the principle of parliamentary sovereignty was, quote, created by the common law, unquote. So what we're witnessing, I think, is a power struggle. The abolition of judicial review by statute would contravene a thick rule of law understanding and it would end judicial supremacy in the United Kingdom. The judges, in seeking to resist the executive creation of such a power balance, would lay claim to a higher authority vested in them by the rule of law. Common law constitutionalism versus executive, otherwise known as parliamentary sovereignty. Who would win in such a power clash? The executive would lay claim to a democratic mandate, the judges to protection, uh, protecting the rule of law. It isn't possible, I think, to predict the outcome as to who would blink first in such a conflict. But the reality is that in modern times, the judges are careful not to assert power directly over the executive. In, a, in his book, The Rule of Law, Lord Bingham makes clear that he fundamentally disagrees with Lord Steyn and Lord Hope, with whom actually he sat in the same case, the Parliament Act case. After citing with implicit approval Richard Elkins's critique of the idea that the judges created parliamentary sovereignty as unargued and unsound, historically false and jurisprudentially absurd, Lord Bingham points to the fact that common law constitutional supremacy would lead to unelected judges claiming enormous political power for themselves. If we step back now for a moment and recognise the subtle balance of power that lies at the heart of the United Kingdom constitutional settlement, it can be seen that real power lies neither in an all-sovereign parliament, nor in a judiciary imposing a supposedly normative but necessarily subjective value system on the organs of government. There is a perpetual balance between the two, with the executive being at one and the same time both master and servant of the courts and of parliament. As Sir Stephen Sedley has convincingly said, quote, parliamentary sovereignty is not a given, but is part of a historic compromise by which the counterpart of the laws, the common law's deference to parliament as the single legislative power has been Parliament's recognition of courts as the single adjudicative power. I have argued, says Sir Stephen, unoriginally, in the past that the legislative and judicial arms of the state are each sovereign in their proper spheres, whereas the executive is answerable politically to Parliament and legally to the courts. This is why, for example, the courts may not call parliamentary proceedings in question and why Parliament will not call judicial decisions in question. It's also why while Parliament may authoritatively decide what the law, uh, what law the courts are to apply and how they are to go on applying it, its authority may intelligibly be said to be conditional on the courts' continued performance of their constitutional role of determining and enforcing legality. Laws without um, 
courts are as mischievous as courts without laws, unquote. Although therefore we think of, in the United Kingdom of, as, of Parliament as the driving force of our informal constitutional arrangements, and within Parliament of the, as the government as the true master, this is a misleading picture. None of the players in the United Kingdom Constitution can afford to play their trump cards too often. But where a trump card falls to be played, it will, according to who is playing it, be that of parliamentary sovereignty, Parliament's trump card, that of possessing a democratic mandate, the government's trump card, or that of the rule of law, the judge's trump card. This brings me back, finally, to Miller. This was a case where any or all of our main constitutional players might have asserted superiority over the other. Lurking in the background, too, and sometimes in the foreground, were the people. The silent majority who believed in Cameron's empty promises, and who, so unused to really being listened to, imagined they had a legal entitlement to see their Brexit wishes fulfilled at the earliest possible time. Yet there were so many tensions over the politics of Brexit that, in fact, no one voice claimed to have the ultimate power. The people had been allowed to vote, and for once, a pattern soon to be repeated in the United States, they had voted against the Liberal establishment. Few MPs, few members of Parliament wanted Brexit, yet if they were not to betray the rash promises they'd been given before the, they'd given before the referendum, it was now the people who called the shots. Even strong Remainers, those who wanted to stay in the EU, accepted there was no going back. Any reneging on the decisiveness of the vote would, I'm sure, have led to civil war. In that potential cauldron, as I see it, nothing in Miller touched directly on the rule of law. In such an uncertain climate, it was hardly the time to bang the drum of constitutional fundamentals. Yet once one understands the balance of power described so uh, graphically by Sir Stephen Sedley, and the need to retain that balance of power, with none of the players directly questioning the other's authority, unless their own constitutional power is directly threatened, it can be seen, perhaps, that deep at the heart of Miller, the United Kingdom courts were placing indirect reliance on the rule of law in its silent and tactful demonstration that only after careful judicial analysis of the law would the executive know whether and how it was entitled to act. If the executive had triggered Article 50 in defiance of the courts, there would have been a constitutional crisis. But if the courts had, as a matter of general principle, driven a hole in the government's power to make and unmake treaties, so too there would have been a constitutional crisis. Dubbed the judges in the divisional court enemies of the people uh, for frustrating the immediate triggering of Article 50 by the government without waiting for Parliament. In deciding Miller as it did, the Supreme Court implicitly recognised that the different vested interests in the outcome would mean uh, that this was no time for false heroics. The Supreme Court played it safe and determined the issues on an extremely narrow basis, creating no wider constitutional precedent for the future. In the end, the Court's verdict was recognised and followed. That in itself may be regarded as a triumph for the rule of law, which is at its most effective when it does not need to shout its identity from the rooftops. Thank you very much, and I hope you have an excellent debate on this very important uh, subject. Thank you. So are you glad we have a written constitution, or do you prefer not to have one? Something to think about. Um, I really want to have a close-up look at those cufflinks at some point. Um, our next speaker is the Deputy Solicitor General of the State of Washington, Ann Egler. Uh, Ann specializes in appellate practice and has argued a wide range of constitutional and uh, election issues in the federal and state court systems. She was part of the Washington attorney team challenging President Trump's executive orders on immigration and graduated from the University of Washington in 1987 with a bachelor's degree in political science and in 1990 received her law degree with honors from Seattle University. On March 9th, 2017, she received the, one, the Washington State Bar Association Local Hero Award. And we have her live, Ann Egmer. Uh, I am going to be speaking about a struggle 
regarding the executive power and the rule of law that is very much ongoing. Uh, so I will be uh, telling you uh, the tales from the trenches about what we are going through in Washington. But first, with respect to the uh, rule of law, as I'm sure you, you probably are aware, in the United States we are very much governed by our Constitution. That is the backstop. Uh, all laws must comply with the Constitution. All of our politicians must comply with the Constitution. We have a, a three-cornered hat in terms of our government with the Congress creating laws, the judiciary reviewing laws, and the president, as you know, exec uh, executing the laws. So the question comes in um, for most of us, and I would say most American attorneys as well, do not often encounter the executive order. And what is this strange beast where a president can, in effect, issue a law rather than just carrying out the law? There is no express constitutional provision that allows an American president um, to, to issue an executive order. There's no mention in our Constitution of creating laws in this way. But since the beginning of our nation, there have been executive orders. And the, the uh, rule of law that the presidents rely on when they do so is their general authority as the executive to take care to enforce uh, the law, to uphold the law, and also they'll turn to specific statutory authority and say if there's a general st a statute, in enforcing that statute it may be necessary to issue uh, an executive order about that. Often these orders are quite innocuous, something about federal employees and when they have time off, etc. But uh, from time to time it is something uh, where the president is filling in where he cannot get uh, authority from Congress. I cannot get them to pass a specific law. So I know you probably cannot see this well, it's a bit blurry, but the, the point of this uh, slide is to show you that the use of executive orders, um, and I'm just going back as far as President Roosevelt during the Second World War, uh, in the modern era, the top uh, five there are from Ronald Reagan through Obama, and it's the average number of orders issued per year. It really doesn't vary that tremendously, except during times of war. So you can see President Roosevelt during, during a time of war uh, acting outside uh, direct congressional authority quite a bit. And uh, perhaps most famously, most infamously, uh, is the order that allowed Japanese internment to occur in the United States uh, during the Second World War. That was challenged in the United States um, and uh, brought to the United States Supreme Court. Unfortunately, the rule of law did not hold there. Uh, the United States Supreme Court held that the president did have authority to issue that law, or excuse me, executive order, allowing the military to uh, perform uh, Japanese internment. The court said that a great deal of deference would be granted to presidential decisions. Uh, he would not be above the rule of law, but in times of national crisis, they would consider that, the national security risks. Uh, famously, the, the United States has recognized the horror of that uh, over time. And, and during uh, President Reagan's uh, era, Congress did issue a statement that this was a clear error. And uh, the Department of Justice, the acting solicitor general, um, during the 2000s admitted that during the argument, of this case in, in favor of Japanese internment, the Justice Department was not forthcoming with the United States Supreme Court. The Supreme Court was given the impression that there were direct secure, national security interests backing this, when in reality the Department of Justice knew that that was not true. So when you have lawyers that are not uh, fulfilling their ethical duties, that impairs the application of the rule of law. And I think that that's particularly important for all of us to reflect upon uh, in, in our country in particular, since we're the country that, that went through this and, and has this blight. But this is something that's very much at the forefront of our conversations right now as we watch what's happening in our nation today. 
uh, wrong button, there we go. When a, a president works to, to uh, issue an executive order and take control of a situation, there are still checks and balances on the president. Congress, if the president is, is basing his, his executive order on a statute, can change that statute and just pull the rug out from under the executive order. Alternatively, where we have a vacuum and Congress is not acting to control the president, what we are seeing in the, the modern era right now, and by modern era I mean the Obama administration through now to the Trump administration, we are seeing what's being termed in the press as the revolt of the, of the uh, state attorneys general. We're seeing the states call upon the courts. The courts cannot act without someone bringing the case to them and the states are fulfilling that role and moving forward to, to challenge. So uh, right now uh, we have uh, President Trump of course and I want to play you a little clip that uh, comes from the campaign period. If we could play that please Paul. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States until our country's representatives can figure out what the hell is going on. So many of us thought that that was campaign rhetoric that would not uh, come to pass, but... Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown. Right, let's move forward. Uh, but, but within a week of being in office, it did come to pass. Uh, President Trump signed uh, the executive order uh, that fulfilled his promise for a Muslim ban. That order suspended entry into the United States by nationals of seven countries, uh, all of which are predominantly Muslim, overwhelmingly uh, Muslim, for 90 days. It suspended the, the United States Refugee Admission Program uh, for 120 days and barred refugees from Syria indefinitely. And uh, at the time that the uh, refugee program was to resume, it contained a preference within it. It said that individuals who are members of a minority religion in their home nation would be given preference when applying to come to the United States. Considering that all of these countries are over 90% Muslim, that meant he was enacting a provision that would favor Christian applicants that were seeking uh, asylum within the United States. He was alleging that he had general constitutional power and that he had authority under the Immigration and Nationalization, uh, Nationality Act. Uh, there's a specific provision in that act that was enacted in 1952 during the Red Scare communist fear eras following World War II that allows the president to exclude individuals uh, if they do pose a national security risk. That has been used very rarely and it has been used uh, by presidents, both Democrat and Republican, when there was a very specific risk that was presented by specific individuals. For example, Clinton barred entry of individuals that were involved in uh, a Haitian coup d'etat against the democratically elected government. He didn't ban anyone with uh, a, you know, a background of having gone to, to Haiti or, or, or had uh, that ethnicity. When President Trump acted, uh, he, when he put this ban into place, it went into effect immediately. There was no period of warning and the result was an eruption of chaos across the country as you may have seen in the news. We had individuals uh, not only from our state but across the nation who were in the United States legally under visas, they had green card authority, etc. They had traveled uh, outside the United States and then were trapped. They couldn't get back in. Individuals were taken off of airplanes or if they were in the air, they, they were redirected when they landed. Uh, there was a, a huge eruption, a uh, passionate eruption on both sides of this issue as soon as it occurred. So that happened on a Friday. 
By Saturday morning, I was called into work. Um, our Attorney General, Bob Ferguson, uh, there was reference uh, earlier to, to lawyers being first responders, and the Attorney General of Washington, in my view, was exactly that at the right time. He immediately reacted to this. He said, we're going to file a complaint, and we're going to do it by Monday. This is not going to stand. We worked like crazy for that weekend, putting that complaint together, getting affidavits from tech companies that were affected by employees being trapped overseas, uh, individuals whose family members were trapped. We had a team of six people, with some working on the complaint, and then myself and others working on uh, legal argument and briefing. And by Monday, we filed a, a complaint, which would go forward as a case, over a, a period of time with full discovery, but also requesting separately that the district court in Washington, an appointed judge, federal district court judge, grant a temporary restraining order while the case was being heard. And we ask that that restraining order apply not just in Washington, but across the nation. Oh, wrong button again. As part of our uh, case, the rule of law that we were relying on was twofold, one constitutional and the second statutory. So starting with the constitutional basis, there were a number of arguments, but the argument as it has gone forward through the courts is sort of uh, focused on these two points, so I'm going to lay these out for you. The first is that this was a violation of the due process clause of the Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution, which provides that before the government impacts you, you have a right to notice and an opportunity to be heard. Obviously, these individuals were impacted immediately. Uh, they, they had no opportunity to, to change their travel plans, to stay tight in the United States and, and avoid this action, nor did they have any ability to appeal the decision that was made about their lives, despite the fact that they had a right, many of them, to legal permanent resident status in the United States. And secondarily, we argued uh, that the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution was violated. Now, the Establishment Clause of the U.S. Constitution provides that the government cannot establish a religion, nor can it favor a religion, and yet this act was focused on individuals from predominantly Muslim countries. And interestingly, this is not true of all constitutional provisions, but the First Amendment is considered to be of even greater importance in many ways than other provisions within our Constitution. And so we look behind the four corners of the action and consider the intent behind it as well. Well, as litigants, that was a gift to us because President Trump had been so vocal during the campaign about his intent to ban Muslims. We also made a statutory argument. So I explained to you that our Immigration and Nationality Act contained a provision that President Trump was relying on that gave him some power if there's a national security uh, reason to, to bar individuals. But we also have a provision that was enacted a bit later during the civil rights era in the United States, and it provides that uh, there will not be discrimination on the basis of race, nationality, place of birth, or place of residence when issuing immigrant visas. Uh, and our contention is that this action is a direct violation of that statutory provision as well as the Constitution. The predominant argument by the government in response is that President Trump's actions are not reviewable. In other words, with respect to President Trump, there is no rule of law. He is the president, and that is that. This argument has been maintained to this day through the, through the recent orders, and I'll trace that through. But the argument was, quote, the president should have the unreviewable authority to suspend the admission of any class of aliens, end quote. With respect to the Establishment Clause problem, assuming that, that, that the states could overcome his, his uh, lack of reviewability, um, the argument was that we could not go beyond the four corners of the document. And on its face, the, the order did not say this is a Muslim ban. It's simply related to seven countries. Uh, not every Muslim country in, in the world uh, it never said that it was preferring one religion over another and therefore on its face could not be treated as discriminatory. 
or establishing or favoring a religion. So we quickly, within days, uh, our Solicitor General, Noah Purcell, was arguing in front of uh, the district court, uh, Judge Robart, who again was politically appointed by a Republican uh, president, and his ruling was, if we could play that, Paul. This TRO is granted on a nationwide basis and prohibits enforcement of sections 3C, 5A, 5B, 5C, and 5E of the executive order. So the injunction was granted, and it was granted nationwide. President Trump's action at that time came to a halt, at least temporarily. This TRO... There we go. Uh, the, the impacts of this were immediate. People stranded overseas could come home immediately. Uh, this meant that tens of thousands of visas were reinstated and that those who were legally within the United States could return. Those applying for uh, immigration could resume their application status. Now, the uh, Trump administration appealed to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. That's an intermediate court before going to the United States Supreme Court. And at that point, uh, the administration continued to argue that President Trump is above the law with respect to issuance of executive orders involving immigration. And this one is a little bit difficult to hear, so I, I, I ask you for a bit of patience. The argument actually, because it was done so tremendously quickly, was done with three uh, Ninth Circuit judges in different locations and done by phone. So it was, it was quite extraordinary, and they had some... Uh, a bit of a challenge with with the audio situation, so the the tape isn't quite pristine. Paul, if we could play that. We thought that was noteworthy, that that pause, I think the government attorney was, he's a tremendously intelligent individual, highly experienced, and in a heck of a situation, to argue to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals that the president's decision is unreviewable was extraordinary. He was asked the question repeatedly, uh, it never got any easier. Uh, he was also asked, as they had been asked at the district court, what is your national security concern? What is this imminent threat that justifies this? And he was unable to answer the question. At no point were they able to put forward any justification for that. In fact, Washington filed a statement, a declaration, on behalf of a number of national security and uh, um, officials at very high levels um, and uh, sec former Secretary of State, people from both Republican and uh, Democratic uh, administrations all stating that individuals from from these countries in the last 40 years had not caused the death of any citizen on American soil and that there was absolutely no threat that they were aware of. So in the face of that, the government was unable to offer anything contradicting it. And not surprisingly, the Ninth Circuit did not rule in favor of, of the executive. The Ninth Circuit ruled in favor of uh, the Washington Attorney General and held and with, return, with respect to the rule of law and its application to the President of the United States that there is no precedent to support this claimed unreviewability which runs contrary to the fundamental structure of our constitutional democracy. So this is a, a decision at, at its, its uh, lowest common denominator. I mean, you can't get any more directly applicable law in, in terms of the president being bound by the Constitution. The court also held, as it needed to, to uphold a temporary restraining order that the state was likely to succeed on the merits of its claim. President Trump, of course, responded <laughs> with a tweet saying, see you in court, the security of our nation is at stake. Well, amusingly, my uh, boss, the, the uh, Attorney General of Washington, responded, we've seen you in court twice, you've lost. <laughs> 
course, the, uh, President Trump had the option, though, of appealing to the United States Supreme Court and considering this great national security interest that he'd been talking about and how immediate this threat is. Um, as, as you've heard, he also tweeted out that the, the district court judge was putting our nation and our people at great risk, and, and yet there was no immediate appeal. Uh, we were watching it hour by hour to see. We were in touch with the U.S. Supreme Court to make sure that you know, the line of communication was open should it come. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Ultimately, uh, the appeal to the Ninth Circuit was withdrawn. Our court costs were paid, and a new executive order was issued. Now, this new executive order happily said that it was revoking and replacing the prior order. Uh, it had an effective date that was 10 days out from the signing, so there was a bit of warning. People knew not to leave the country uh, before it went into effect. It deleted its application to those who were legal permanent residents in the United States, the green card holders, the visa holders, etc. It also eliminated any reference to individuals from Iraq. So our list of seven countries is now down to six. And it treated Syrian refugees just the way that it treated individuals from uh, other countries. What it did do, though, was suspend entry for those without a visa outside the U.S. from the remaining six countries. And it suspended the U.S. refugee program and uh, cut down the number that would be admitted annually by more than half. Now, unlike the prior order, it contended that there was an additional due process element uh, afforded because Waivers could be granted on a case-by-case -case basis, but there was no standard put in. There was no right to that review inserted within the order. It was simply an empty promise. And to bolster the national security concern, the order does contain some um, references to terrorist activity, although not tied specifically to individuals from the countries that it addresses. Now remember that with respect to our establishment clause, an establishment of a religion or preference for a religion, intent matters when the courts review. And yet, President Trump reaffirmed his campaign promises and intent by stating that the principles of this executive order remain the same. And he sent a top uh, policy advisor, Stephen Miller, to do the circuit of uh, news shows and uh, Mr. Miller was happy to tell the public that the new order reflects mostly minor technical differences. We're doing the same thing. So uh, naturally, there was a reaction. We've got the same type of uh, animus going on here. We are still dealing with a Muslim ban. And uh, we had a, a number of um, states, Washington included, and Hawaii, separately filed actions against the separate the second executive order. Uh, Hawaii's case has moved forward faster than ours, so ours is on hold while we support Hawaii's efforts in the Ninth Circuit with a number of other states. Uh, but the case that has moved forward the fastest is on the East Coast, and that's a case that was brought by six individuals that are affected by the order. To have uh, individuals who clearly have constitutional rights, the case was brought by uh, people who are legally in the country or American citizens who are affected uh, by this order, for example, by trying to get a spouse into the country legally. They're in the middle of the visa process, and this has cut them off. And then in addition, they have a few uh, refugee assistance uh, organizations that have joined that suit as well. So that has moved forward first. That court, the district court level, granted a temporary restraining order against the second executive order uh, nationwide again, and that went up to our Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, again, an intermediate step before the U.S. Supreme Court. And the Fourth Circuit ruled that the question is whether the Constitution protects the right to challenge an executive order that, quote, speaks with vague words of national security, but in context drips with religious intolerance, animus, and discrimination. So. I'm sure you can see how the <laughs> decision came out just from those opening words. Uh, 
the, the test applied by the court in terms of the rule of law said that we will defer to the president. We recognize his authority over immigration, but we will not abdicate the court's role or the role of the U.S. Constitution. So the, in other words, the rule of law is not going to be ignored. It applies to him as well. And they applied a two-part test. First, is the, is the document facially legitimate? Uh, is it valid on its face? And having found that it is, uh, it would not be subject to further scrutiny but for the fact that bad faith was raised. And because bad faith was raised, they asked the second question, is this a bona fide order? Uh, was it issued in good faith? And now they look back to Washington's filing with the national security advisors, the former secretaries of state, saying there is no security risk. And tellingly, almost immediately after that second executive order was issued, the Department of Homeland Security issued a report stating this will not help us with any terrorist threat. With respect to the Establishment Clause, uh, the, the court reiterated purpose matters and that this executive order cannot be divorced from the animus that inspired it. But Trump did have one uh, minor win within this that is interesting, putting it in the context not just of President Trump, but this is a ruling that will have a historical impact going down the line. And they determined that the temporary restraining order will remain in place with respect to the federal government, with respect to the actions taken by the president, but not with respect to the president himself. The president is not restrained, uh, but whatever the president does is subject to review. At the Ninth Circuit, the case was argued a week later. They have not yet issued a decision. And during that argument, one of the justices of the Ninth Circuit uh, linked this to Japanese internment. And turning to that Mandel test I listed earlier, he asked the government, who frankly, the government attorney, uh, Jeff Wall, did a superb job. It's not the side of the case I agree with, but I do think he did an outstanding job in his legal argument. But when this question was asked, he faltered. And the question was, if this, if we find that this wasn't done in bad faith, how can we say that that decision that allowed Japanese internment was not done in bad faith? And throughout this, the Korematsu Center, which uh, advocates and, and reminds us of the horrors of Japanese internment, has participated in all of the court cases, filing amicus briefs, um, in, in support of the states and the individuals who, that have been challenging these actions. So that history uh, is very much in the minds of those who are working on the cases uh, as well as the decision makers. So next steps. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals hasn't ruled, but when it does, I don't think that case will move ahead of the Fourth Circuit. Um, it was only a three-judge panel. That means that there's a right within the Ninth Circuit to ask for the full court to hear it before you go up to the U.S. Supreme Court. So that delays things a bit. Um, and from the Fourth Circuit, the uh, United States Attorney General has said that they do intend to appeal to the United States Supreme Court. So we're waiting to see whether that happens. If they appeal, uh, as I expect you're probably aware, that doesn't mean that the United States Supreme Court will hear the case. They ask the court, are you willing to take the case? They petition for that certiori. Uh, if the court hears the case, um, then it will be decided upon by the US Supreme Court. If not, the Fourth Circuit decision stands. The TRO remains in place. And the cases in all of the uh, pending locations, both on the East Coast in Washington and in Hawaii will go forward on the merits. So that's where we currently are. So John, if you wanted to move on to questions. Of course. Let's take it. <laughs> Fabulous presentation. Thank so the court you. found that there was no way to restrain President Trump. <laughs> uh, he is very unrestrained. Um, we are going to uh, have a couple of uh, microphones available for questions. I'm going to ask one question, and then we're going to turn to the audience, and uh, 
will stay uh, with us uh, for a while. Let's we'll see if you have questions. Uh, so, we are clearly living in an age of digital information overload, creative narratives, alternate facts, fake news, trolls, foreign interference, and domestic elections. Against that backdrop, the suddenly hard question for us lawyers and citizens is how do we know? How do we know when and if the rule of law is genuinely threatened? There's so much noise, so much yelling and shouting from all sides of the political spectrum. It seems really hard to know. So what lessons and did you learn lessons from all that hard work on that <laughs> weekend and beyond uh, that can help us discern what's real and what isn't? Well, to me, uh, I would answer by with two words, uh, reading and listening. And with respect to reading, I guess the lesson to me was I have to read Twitter, too. That was shocking. <laughs> but boy, things were popping on Twitter throughout that, that uh, time period when we were rapidly working through the courts that um, w w we had to use. So thank goodness there were some young lawyers on the case, too. Uh, but also learning that my favorite, the New York Times, is not... Uh, it's not acceptable to rely on that solely. It does have, have some bit of a left-leaning bias. Uh, so it, 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 it is critical, I think, to read things that lean the other way, like the Wall Street Journal, and get, get a, a bigger picture by looking at a variety of news sources. And that even includes turning on Fox News sometimes, uh, as, as well as you know, CNN or NBC. Uh, to, to get the, the bigger picture. And I think that it's especially important to understand what are other people on the ground feeling. There has been a divide like I have never seen. Uh, my parents and my in-laws are in their late 70s and early 80s. They have never seen um, between the, the people in the United States, the, the pro-Trump, the anti-Trump. It's so much so that there was a great deal in, in the media about how do you bear the Thanksgiving and Christmas meals with your family members. Um, but it kind of wasn't a joke. I mean, you just did not want to open this up because a permanent rift could could develop people you know unfriended each other on Facebook etc I think that needs to stop I think we need to start listening to people who take the contrary position and return some normality there uh, there's a reason why people support different positions and we need to get past the rhetoric and listen uh, and continue on as a nation but if we can if we divide I think that's when when the rule of law stops being respected by the people on the ground uh, and that would be the ultimate crime here. Thank you. Questions from the audience and we'll get a microphone to you if you could put up your hand. Uh, very interesting presentation. I have two questions. Uh, one uh, about war and the second uh, about competence or knowledge. The first one is uh, I have read the news and on the internet that United States and its proxies, for instance Saudi Arabia, have been and are continuing to kill people in several of these uh, six or seven countries, which to me means that the United States is at war. And as a military officer, I know the name for that kind of war is called asymmetrical war, conventional uh, machinery, drones, <clears throat> bombardments uh, from one side and they respond by uh, guerrilla warfare, terrorism, etc. So my question in relation to that is, uh, should the president not be concerned that he needs to scrutinize immigrants from countries where we are killing people? There might be someone who simply wants to revenge, his family has been killed. So in other words, I don't think Great Britain in war against Germany during the Second World War would easily allow Germans to immigrate into England. In other words, you don't want to get uh, pot potential enemy combatants into your country. Now, the second question is, thinking of the division of power, like the ju judiciary, uh, is the judiciary competent in foreign policy? Do the judges, these judges, do they have access to national security briefings, the military intelligence, etc.? And I'm thinking also 
what informed Trump, according to his statement in a recent uh, press conference, uh, guess where I got that list of those countries? It was Obama who gave me that list. You've got to be very careful uh, before you let people in from those countries. So that's, those are my questions. You, you are absolutely right. That list of countries was created by President, then President Obama. Uh, he was listing these as areas of concern and of uh, areas where t terrorist activity was uh, fomenting. And as a result, the United States immigration program became more vigilant with respect to individuals from those countries. Not barring them, but putting in place extremely tight background checks on those individuals. So this is not about should we let them ask to come in and, and enter without screening. The process is about two years, is my understanding, and there were uh, families that had gone through that two-year screening process and were literally on the plane coming to this country to escape situations like Syria. And despite all of that screening, we're told, get off the plane, start over, if ever, uh, as a result of that order. Uh, so y yes, uh, there is tight screening. There is need for that. There's a recognition, uh, both from Republicans and, and Democrats, about the need for that tight screening. Um, as far as the competency of the judiciary, I have extremely high regard for, for the American judiciary. Uh, our judges are appointed by both Republican and Democrat uh, presidents, depending on who's in office when the vacancy comes up. These, these tend to be extremely intelligent uh, individuals. With respect to their ability to consider uh, foreign affairs, uh, as in the Korematsu case, the government can come forward during argument and tell the judges that there is a security risk. If need be, there's a possibility of documents being reviewed in camera. But in this case, the government did not come forward and say, there's a risk, but it's super secret and we can't tell you. They didn't point to anything but the vaguest of concerns, that we know that there are terrorists in these countries. That's it. That's it. We're not talking about a situation where the government said they have classified information, they know for a fact something is coming. Uh, they, this has remained very vague arguments. We have a question right in the center. Is there any material difference in the current pending uh, suits? Does it make any difference whether the Washington case, the Hawaii case, or the East Coast case proceeds to the Supreme Court? What's interesting is that there are uh, different standing issues, uh, the ability to come forward and make the legal claim. With the states, uh, our standing is a bit different. Uh, at this point, because the cases um, are not involving those who already have visas or green cards. It, it has a different effect on the states. We do have some uh, university officials, recruitment efforts that are impacted. Um, the, the effect on employers within the, within the states, the high-tech employers for Washington in particular, is lessened by the new order. But the arguments that are coming forward are the same in, in all of these cases. So no, we're not really concerned about the Fourth Circuit case uh, going forward. And I, I think probably Probably the government, the, the U.S. government, feels comfortable with that case as well. The, the, the arguments are all teed up there as well. Question over here. Uh, right here, thank you. The, um, I practice law from home, so sometimes I have two or three news channels going on at a time, so I've followed this very closely. Um, and you and your boss have done you, yeoman services, first responders, for the rule of law, in my opinion. Um, but what concerns me, or what I wonder about, is that while you're a very divided country politically, um, it also, it can't escape our notice that these actions are coming from New England, the Northwest, that tend to be a bit more liberal. Whereas the lawyers, the so-called first responders for the rule of law in the Southern states, for example, um, are awfully, awfully quiet. So I'm wondering, what is constraining them? Are they saying that they disagree with you, that they actually believe the president's actions are beyond review? Or are they just politically constrained? I mean, when you speak to them, where are they? I mean, why are we only dealing with actions from two or three states? Where are they is in the court. Uh, Texas led an amicus brief, a friend of the court brief, on behalf of uh, a total of 13 states in favor 
of uh, the executive order. And this brief was filed in, in the uh, Fourth Circuit case. We had, uh, of course, a corresponding brief um, in, in support of those who were challenging the order. So the Republican states' attorneys generals are also quite active. And uh, in fact, even before this, during the Obama administration, uh, Texas was challenging the pro-immigrant actions that were being taken by Obama. And uh, I was working with our attorney general filing briefs on behalf of, of multiple uh, states, of course, from the West Coast and the, and the East uh, supporting the Obama administration. So this has been going on uh, for the last few years, both with Republican and Democratic presidents. But they're very active in this case as well. Question over here. I, I've noticed that all of these these cases that we've been talking about have been dealing with the temporary restraining order portion of it and then the case on the merits is to be heard later. Are you expecting that the full case on the merits will be heard or do you think that the real fight is with the temporary restraining orders and if those are upheld at the Supreme Court, if that will be the end of the fight? You know, I'm not sure. We're not sure. So we are teeing everything up in the district court to go forward with, with the primary case. We've got discovery requests and, and whatnot that we're rolling forward with. But the court is telling us, let's wait and see what the United States Supreme Court does before we start subjecting high-level federal officials to these discovery requests and depositions. So I really don't know. But I, I, I do feel that uh, if it does go to the United States Supreme Court, we're going to get some solid guidance that will affect how those cases move forward if they do. Are there any last questions? I knew this was coming. Yes. I, I don't want to preempt you, John, but one of the things that, that I do is I teach ethics up at Thompson Rivers and Kamloops. And when all this was happening, um, I said to my students, thank you for making being a lawyer a dream job. So thank you. <laughs> well, I, I will ask this, or make this point question following on my colleague. Um, I felt the swelling of pride as a lawyer when lawyers across the states were first responders, went to airports, uh, and helped in the immediacy of the first ban. How did you see that as a I lawyer so, and as a citizen? I so agree. And and there were so many that went out and, and just hopped in and started volunteering. Whether they knew about immigration law or not, they went out and worked with an organization that did, that could mentor them in providing that service on the ground. And that's continuing on today because while there's a temporary restraining order in effect, there is tremendous fear on the ground. Children are going to school uh, in highly Hispanic areas, for example, in California, with notes in their backpacks telling the school what to do if their parents are abducted uh, before the school day is over. There, that uh, Small children having to think, mom might not be there for me tonight. So helping individuals on the ground and lawyers being there, uh, it, it just means the world. And, and, and as someone who is very active in community service, um, I just urge every attorney to look for those opportunities that you feel comfortable with, but there are so many needs uh, out there regardless of where you are. And the, the work that lawyers do, I think, is often unsung in the general community, um, but it is just critical. I don't think we could have a better note to end uh, the Law Society of BC's first annual Rule of Law Lecture Series. Thank you to all of you for coming. Thank you. Thank you to Anne and to Richard for everything they've done. Um, it's, it's just been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you to you, John. Good night, everybody. Drive safely.